join with me in our call to worship. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Let us pray together. Hear our prayer, O oh God, as we come to sing your praises. Bless us with your steadfast love in times of peace and in times of trial. Make your presence known to us this day, for we seek to know you better. Enliven us with your spirit of truth and increase our faith, even as we place our hope and trust in you. Amen. We worship you, O Lord, for truly you are our King. We worship you because of your grace and mercy. For in your grace, Lord, you have forgiven us of our sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sin from us. Father, we come this day standing before you as a people cleansed of all unrighteousness, even holy and pure in your sight. And we praise your name. We worship you, our King, our Lord, our God, in whose name we praise. Amen. A man by the name of Harold Lamb told a story about making a sales presentation at a church one time. He said that he and a coworker were at a small rural church and they gave a presentation to a church committee. At the end of the presentation, when they were calling on the church to buy the product, the chairman of the committee got up, <coughs> walked down the aisle, knelt before the altar, after a few moments, got up, went back to where the committee was meeting and said, God tells me that we should just wait. Well, Harold says that then his colleague got up from the meeting, went down to the altar, knelt after a few moments, went back to where they were meeting and said, God says he needs to talk to you again. Harold says that he wasn't sure whether or not either man was actually praying and talking to God, but he found it interesting that both men viewed prayer as a means of getting what they wanted. Is there anything wrong with viewing prayer that way? Seeing prayer as a means to getting what we actually want. I think that James in his letter would say, actually, that's a perfectly acceptable way of viewing prayer. In fact, James writes that we don't have because we don't ask for what we want in prayer. In other parts of his letter, James says, if we lack wisdom, guess what we should do? 
pray. James says, if we're troubled, guess what we should do? Pray. And if we're sick, guess what we should do? We should call the elders of the church and have them pray. In other words, James is saying, if there's something that we want or need from God, we should pray. <clears throat> and we should have others pray for us. So I guess the question then becomes, do we? Do we actually pray? I think most of us, hopefully, I guess I shouldn't jump to conclusions, but hopefully most of us believe that God hears and answers our prayers. I meant to grab it out of my files, but I have a copy of Life magazine in 1994, where they published a survey that indicated that 94% of people who say that they prayed regularly actually believe that God answers prayer. So again, the question is, if we really believe that God answers prayer, do we pray as often as we should? How many of you pray as often as you should? Don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass people. I, I think the reality is most of us, if we're honest, would admit that we don't pray as often as we should. I, in my files, that I didn't take the time to hunt out because it would have taken me a long time. I have the results of surveys that show how much time people spend praying. And it's not pretty. It's less than five minutes a day for most people. Don't feel bad. Most people don't pray as often or as long as they should. Larry Davies in an online magazine, Heartlight, talked about a class that he was teaching. And he asked his class the same question that Life Magazine asked years ago. Do you believe that God answers prayer? And the class basically responded the same way. Of course, yes, we believe that God answers prayer. So then he said, why don't we pray like we should? Well, there, you know, there was an uncomfortable silence, kind of like when I asked or tell jokes. And the top two responses that really kind of morph into one People said, well, I don't pray because I honestly don't know how to pray. And the second, I don't know what to say. And I really think those kind of morph into one. And I think that that's true of a lot of people. A lot of people, if we're honest, are uncomfortable praying because I really don't know how to pray. And I think that that's part of why the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And I think that James understood our hesitancy in prayer. And that's why James gives us an example of how to pray. James says, Elijah was a man just like us, but he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land 
for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced crops. In other words, if we want a good example of how to pray, James says, look at Elijah. And that's what we're going to do this morning in 1 Kings chapter 18. But before we turn to the passage, I want to give a little exam a little background on 1 Kings 18. At the time of 1 Kings 18, the king of Israel was a man by the name of Ahab. And Ahab was married to a Philistine woman. You know about the Philistines? Philistines, Philistines and the Israelites didn't get along too well because the Israelites were God's people. The Philistines were about as far away from God's people as you could get. They worshiped idols. They worshiped pagan gods. They were evil people. And Ahab was married to a Philistine woman who has become infamous because of her wickedness. Do you know who I'm talking about? Jezebel, Jezebel exactly. You know, that's a name that has gone down in history. Um, not like Princess Diana. No, 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 no. Partly because of Jezebel's evil influence, Ahab and the nation of Israel had fallen into kind of a hybrid paganism. They, they still supposedly worshiped and prayed to the Lord God, Yahweh. But, and I once had a man in one of my churches that said, whenever you hear the word but, it means disregard everything previously said. So yes, they worshiped and prayed to the Lord God, Jehovah, but they also worshiped Baal and Asherah and all the pagan gods and idols of the Philistines and the other pagan lands around them. Do you think that the Lord God Jehovah was pleased that the Israelites supposedly worshiped him and all these idols? No, because God says, thou shalt have no other gods. It's not like, oh yeah, hedge your bets. You can worship me and everybody else, just make sure that, you know, you're, you've got your bets covered. No, God says, no, it's me and all the others. No, God says it's me or it's not, you know. When a man gets married, the woman doesn't say, oh yeah, you can keep your little black book. <laughs> no. No, you know, it, it's like um, you can't marry me and keep all your girlfriends and still, you know, marry me and go out on dates with all the. No, it's me or her. It's not me and her. It's not a Mormon marriage. Now, I always wondered how that works. And God says, no, thou shalt have no other gods, period. So God was not pleased. But that's what Ahab and the Israelites were trying to do. They tried to worship the Lord God Jehovah and Baal and Asherah and all the others. So because of their disobedience, God sent Elijah to tell King Ahab and the nation of Israel that he was going to punish them with a drought. There would be no rain for three and a half years. At the end of that three and a half year period, God sent Elijah back to Ahab and offered a challenge. Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. This was bigger than Ollie Frazier. Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You all come. 
All of Israel gathered at the foot of the mountain and Elijah confronted them. How long will you wait? How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. It's not both and, it's either or. Choose this day whom you will serve. And the challenge begins. Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets. But if Baal has 450 prophets, get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces, put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will, pre I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. All the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bowls, prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bowl given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us. But there was no response. No one answered. They danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder. They slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed. They continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. That shows that they really weren't worshiping God because the altar lay in ruin. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes descended from, I, from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, Elijah built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug a trench around it large enough to hold two sea as a seed. He arranged the wood cut the bowl in pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water, pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again. They did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. They did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar, even filling the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant. And I have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that the people will know that you are Lord, you are God, and you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of all. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them there. Now, that could easily be a sermon or two or three. But all this precedes the prayer that James says is our example. So let's see what's so special about the prayer. Elijah said to Ahab, go eat, drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off just a little ways away to eat and drink. And Elijah climbed to the Mount, of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told a servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing there. Seven times, Elijah prayed and then said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot. Go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, 
the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose and a heavy rain started falling. And Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So what is it that makes Elijah's prayer such a great example for us? First, he works his prayer. We need to be persistent. Notice how he prays. He's praying, kneeling. I can't do this. That's fine. With his head between his knees, it hurts. Now, I don't know. Maybe there's a deep theological reason for that. I don't think so. I think Elijah did it because it hurts. I think Elijah prays like that simply so that he doesn't get distracted, so that he is focused on his prayer, so that he is uncomfortable and he's not distracted by what's going on around him and he can remain focused on God and focused on praying for rain. It's easy for us to get distracted, isn't it? When we pray, we need to be persistent and be focused. Notice how many times does Elijah pray? Not once, not twice, not three, seven times. He keeps at his prayer until he receives an answer. Don't give up. Be persistent. When we are persistent, we're spending time with God. And we're telling God, he matters. We're telling God that he's important to us. We're telling God that that request is important to us. Be persistent. Work your prayer. In your bulletin, there's an insert. You can call it a prayer journal. And I want you to use this to work your prayers this week. You might want to, I want, I want you to use the back to write a prayer request. More about that later. You might want to jot down the points of the prayer or the sermon. The first point would be be persistent. Work your prayer. Be focused. Be persistent. Secondly, Elijah was specific in his prayer. He didn't just say, God bless Israel. He specifically prayed for rain. A specific prayer is one that you know when God's answered it. You know, if I go to the grocery store, I don't just say, buy groceries. Because if it's that general, when I get to hy V or Fairway or Aldi's, I don't know what to buy. But if I'm going to buy milk, I put milk on the list. And I don't just put milk on the list. I put soy milk or whatever kind of milk Diane wants. And if I want mustard, guess what? I am very specific. I want French's mustard or Kraft mustard. That's it. Not generic store brand mustard. It's got to be French's or Kraft. That's it. Otherwise, don't buy me that garbage mustard. <laughs> be specific in your prayers. Elijah was praying for rain. Third, Elijah was praying for something that he knew God wanted to do. Elijah was praying for something that he knew was God's will. God wanted to bring rain. That's why Elijah had come back. First Kings chapter 18 verse 1 says, after a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came back, came to Elijah. Go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the land. 
when we need when we pray we need to think about why god should want to answer our prayers that's what jesus meant when he said you may ask me for anything in my name and i will do it to ask in jesus name means you are asking god for something that you believe he wants to do it means praying as christ prayed in the garden not my will but thy will be done praying in jesus name means speaking on his behalf pray asking for what we believe jesus wants us to ask for praying in jesus name simply does not mean tacking in the name of jesus amen onto a prayer that is narcissistic and selfish. So when you write your prayer request on this, ask yourself, is my request something that God wants to do? Is my request according to his will? Fourth, when Elijah prayed, he included someone else. Elijah just didn't look up himself. He asked his servant to be involved. Jesus said, I tell you, if two or three on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. With your prayer request, get your family, your friends, your church involved. Pray together. Agree, unite, be in one accord. Fifth, once Elijah prayed, he behaved as a man expecting an answer. Every time he prayed, what did he do? He had the servant looked up to see if there were rain clouds in the sky. Once a cloud was seen, what did he do? He said, Tell Ahab to get going because otherwise his chariot's going to get stuck in the mud. There's a story told of a western town that was going through a drought. One of the local churches announced a special prayer meeting to pray for rain. That night the church was packed. But the preacher told him, go home. We're not going to pray for rain. Well, why not? He said, because you don't believe that God's going to answer a prayer. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? None of you brought an umbrella. Now, I don't know whether that's a true story or not. But I do know that that's how God looks at our prayers. James said, when a person prays, they must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That one should not think that they will receive anything from the Lord. They are a double-minded person, unstable in all that they do. When we pray, we need to pray expectantly, believing that God will answer. I want you to pray. Pray believing that if you're praying according to God's will, he will answer. But remember, sometimes the answer is wait. And sometimes the answer is no. But both of those are legitimate answers. Lastly, Elijah prayed with the hope that his prayer would be a witness. Notice Elijah told the king to sit down and eat. Why? Why didn't he send the king back to the palace? I mean, after all, the challenge was over. But he told the king to sit down and eat. Because Elijah wanted the king to be there to witness the prayer and to witness the answer. The king was watching, 
watching as Elijah prayed, watching as Elijah sent the servant to look for the rain cloud. And when Elijah heard that the cloud was in the sky, Elijah told Ahab to hitch up the chariot and get going because Elijah wanted Ahab to witness God's answer to the prayer. The drought, the confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and now the prayer. It was all to change the hearts of the people and the heart of Ahab. As evil and as wicked as King Ahab was, God still cared about the king. God still was concerned about the king's salvation. Peter wrote, God is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but wanting all to come to repentance. That's how much God loved Ahab. That's how much God loves all of us. One man said, to become more effective in our praying, we need to remember, it's not the arithmetic of our prayers, how many they are, nor the rhetoric of our prayers, how eloquent they are, nor the geometry of our prayers, how long they are, nor the music of our prayers, how sweet our voice may be, nor the method of our prayers, how orderly they are, nor even the theology of our prayers, how good the doctrine may be. No, none of that matters to God. It's the fervency of our prayers, the faithfulness of our prayers. That's what unleashes the power of God. We've talked about prayer this morning. And it's time to pray. It's time to pray because there's power in prayer. It's time to pray because prayer changes things. It's time to pray because prayer is our only hope. It's time to pray. Father, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. <coughs> James gives us the example of Elijah in order to teach us to pray. Father, you've taught us to pray. And now, Lord, it's time for us to pray. It's time for us, Lord, to be persistent in our prayers and be specific in our prayers. It's time for us to pray according to your will. It's time for us to be united in our prayers. It's time for us to be believing in our prayers. And above all us, Lord, it's time for us to pray. For truly, there is power in our prayers prayers. That's what we see in the life of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day <coughs> our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine. According to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.